and ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, bring out your dead. We've got a Samsung stove board here out of an induction stove. A buddy of mine repairs appliances and wanted to see whether this one was mostly dead or all dead. So you can see the board's broken into sections there. There's two identical, um, pretty much identical circuits. One runs a bigger element, and these boards have a problem with that larger element section always blowing up. Um, I suspect there was a perfectly good design, and then they decided to put a bigger element on it at the factory. Some engineer thought it was a good idea. Anyway, you can see there's a bit of a poop stain there in the middle. On the back there, it looks like it's got some heat in it. The uh, green solder resist has a bit of a bubble in it. Just came right off with my finger there. The copper underneath seems okay. I don't see any scorching or discoloration. You can see the copper is nice and bright. So that's probably okay uh, if we want to put some green solder resist over that just to, if we feel it's necessary. Just doing a couple preliminary checks here. There's uh, two IGBTs mounted on either side, the two on the left are for the the big element that blew up and the two on the right are for uh, yeah you can see one of them and this one's dead shorted and the two on the right are for the other element and the the black uh, part in the middle there is a bridge rectifier which provides power for the entire board both elements and as you can see this is shorted out too you gotta be careful sometimes when you test things and they appear to be shorted while they're mounted on the circuit board. It's not actually the part that's shorted. It can be the board, something else that they're connected to on the board is shorted. But in any case, something's not right here. These IGBTs seem to be okay. The two for the smaller element seem to be fine here. So before we can remove the heatsink assembly, which is easier to do all as one unit, uh, you can mess around with trying to unscrew individual transistors and trying to remove them one at a time, but I find it more of a hassle. Just use a desoldering gun and take all the solder joints apart then remove the whole heat sink as one unit with everything still bolted to it. Sometimes you have to do it that way because the that's how it's assembled in the factory. They put everything in as one unit, then they solder it. Uh, but then they put the rest of the components in place and sometimes you can't get at the screws uh, for the transistors anyway. So you have to pull it all out as one unit. Uh, you saw me clean the there's a conformal coating on the bottom of the board and you don't want that running through your nice desoldering gun so I used a little bit of acetone to clean that off first you can see some of the pins here the traces are so fat and they're veered to the other side of the board there's traces on the other side of the board too and there's a huge amount of copper there so it's having trouble getting all the solder to melt it's a huge amount of area to heat up so when that happens, what you can do is just re-solder it using a, a lead solder or a lower melting point solder, which dilutes this lead-free solder, which melts quite hot. And then try again with the desoldering gun, and you'll find it works quite well. So here I'm just checking to make sure that 
all of the pins are loose in the holes because if one is still soldered to the trace and you rip the entire heatsink assembly out of there you will rip the trace off the board too and that's a bad day just tinning up the soldering iron or the desoldering gun tip here before I put it away it's always good to keep take good care of your equipment this is probably my favorite tool that I've ever bought myself. They're expensive but they are so nice to use. They make working on projects like this so much nicer. So now that we've got all the solder pins loosened off, now it's time to undo the bolts that hold the heatsink down or the screws. So I don't know yet if this board is going to be fixable, but we can't really see anything with the uh, heat sink in the road, so we're going to take it apart and try and assess what, if anything, is salvageable. You see with this pins loose, it just comes right off. There's no, uh, no fighting with anything, it just literally falls out of the board. So now you can start to see the larger poop stain. Uh, when these things blow up, they really blow up. There's typically chunks welded into the aluminum heatsink. Arc marks. We'll see what of this comes off, if anything. Uh, that's pretty bad. It's a confined space, and when you get something blow up like that, you've got a lot of power and nowhere to go. And it makes a mess. And there you can see there's all kinds of carnage. Those two resistors and kind of the lower center there that are blown clean off the board, uh, they feed power into the inverter. So we'll just give everything a bit of a scrub down here and uh, get some of the soot out of the road so we can see what's what. Try not to uh, rip anything else off the board if you're using a rag and some alcohol like I was. Um, if something's loose on the board you can snag it. This capacitor took me a while to figure out where it came from but it comes from right there. It was the top half of that one that blew off. So let's just get rid of that. There's the two main resistors I was telling you about that feed the power through to the the inverter stage. So now we'll check the actual parts now that we're disconnected from the board. Uh, as you can see the one on the IGBT on the left has got pieces missing. This one's completely shorted. Gate collector and emitter are all welded together. That usually happens when IGBTs blow. I mean either they end up like the one on the left or the one I'm testing now. And the bridge rectifier has some shorted diodes in it. So with IGBTs the gate can float on or off so when you're testing them, okay first of all we'll test the body diode which is backwards across the collector and emitter. So the anode's the third pin, the cathode's the second pin. Uh, you'll see me manually turn the gate on or off with the uh, multimeter leads here. In case I'm turning it off there. Gates shut. Okay, I'll manually turn it off. Test collector to emitter. Should be no conduction. Now I'll turn the gate on. Now I'll test again. There should be conduction. Turn it off. Test again. So both the ones on the right turn on and off. So they're probably still good. And we tested the body diodes. And they're still good too. So now we'll get to pulling the dead stuff off the heat sink. Mm -hmm. 
and I don't know what kind of goo they used to hold this on there. This is old school stuff. I don't know if it's silicone or what, but it's it's gooey. It it gets everywhere if you don't control it. Time for reinforcements. some standard materials for mounting uh, parts to heat sinks and it doesn't seem like Samsung uses any of them. Most uh, companies will use a, a thin silicone gasket behind the parts but anyway Samsung has their own ideas about things. So I'll get some of this soot out of the road. As you can see, there is some stuff that's not coming off that heat sink because it's arced right in there. There's literally pieces burned out of the heat sink. And again, Samsung with their non-standard ways of doing things. I'm not, I'm not clamping on these very hard with the pliers. I'm just giving them enough to twist them off of there because I couldn't get them off with my fingers. They have some kind of a mylar tape or something with uh, some kind of wax on both sides of it. I've never seen this exact stuff before. It's some kind of capped on or mylar or whatever tape in between. It's kind of brownish. Clear plastic. Clear brown plastic. Anyway, comes off just like the rest. I found it's easier to scrape this off dry with a Q-tip. It kind of chunks off and then you can finish up with a alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol works to clean it up after. Q-tips to get into the grooves. Yeah, you can see that. It's not... What's left there, the black stuff, is not coming off. And I might as well leave the good ones on there for now. So we need to figure out what uh, IGBTs these are. Don't know if you can see that clearly or not. We'll get the microscope out. Yeah, they look at all that arcing. Eh? And if you feel that with your finger, it's it's right in there. There's trenches. Nice little bit of fractal burning there. So now we want to figure out everything that's wrong with the board, find out whether it's salvageable. There's the rough overview there. You want to pause and look at that. So the way I like to do it, I like to make a list of components I know are bad. So we'll go through and start noting down what's destroyed. First of all, we need to identify those IGBTs. There's the part number H50ER5. When you look up data sheets make sure you find one that has the actual same marking code. There are several. Now the drivers for the IGBTs. Now you can see the lid's blown off of that one. Luckily we have a good one on the other side of the board. So we'll take a look at that after turning the light off in the microscope. And then we'll find a data sheet for that. So now because we have two pretty much identical IGBT or inverter circuits on each side of the board, what I'm doing is I'm going back and forth comparing measurements between one side of the board and the other. Between the blown up side and the, and the one that isn't. So if you see me take a reading on the left and then we'll go take a reading on the right and they should match and if they don't match something is wrong.
So this is all a circuitry between the driver chip and the IGBT. So there's several resistors and diodes and zener diodes and capacitors and whatnot surrounding the IGBT, which um, controls how the how fast it turns off, how fast it turns on, that kind of thing. As you can see, there's quite a few components which are blown up. Um, what I like to do other than writing everything down on a list because all these parts will need to be changed if we're going to get this board working again uh, when I do find a component that doesn't work and I know it to be bad I will put a dot of yellow paint on top of it it's hard to uh, hard to erase and easy to see makes things a little easier later on when you're stripping the bad components off and replacing new ones so what I'm starting to worry about here on this board is because everything took such a huge power surge, uh, I'm wondering about the controller's coherence. If it is a controller problem, this is a proprietary controller, and I won't be able to buy another one. Um, Samsung probably doesn't build it themselves, they probably buy it from somebody else, put their software in it, but they put their logo on it too, so I have no way of knowing what the original controller is, and if I did know, I still wouldn't be able to get Samsung software. If you're at all uncertain about the size of resistors that you're replacing, or capacitors, uh, it's not currently against the law to get your calipers out and measure them. There are standard sizes, it's fairly easy to figure out. In order to figure out whether the controller is good, I need to know which pins are VDD and VSS, or plus 3.3 volts and ground. Uh, I don't know on a 64-pin chip, but I do know where they are on the driver chips, and they share the same power supply with the controller. So, uh, we'll look at this diagram there, and we will put one pin of our multimeter on a known VSS pin, and we will check the controller to see where VSS is on the controller. Once we know that, uh, most microcontrollers have uh, ESD protection diodes on each input-output pin. So it looks kind of like this. This is for static discharge. Now if the high voltage fault found its way all the way to the controller, then some of these diodes will be fried because they're only made to uh, handle very small discharges, not an event of this magnitude. So what we're going to do is we're going to test the diodes on the four controller pins which go to the drivers. So that's a good reading. That's a normal 582 millivolt diode drop. But there is a problem. They were high. Uh, 948 millivolts is way higher than the other pins. And there are things which can cause lower resistance if the board is shorted or something like that, but there's nothing but an internal controller fault that would cause higher resistance. So unfortunately, the controller is fried. Just doing uh, another check here with uh, reverse polarity to see how that looks but yeah this uh, board is not fixable unless we have another board with a good chip on it so what do you do if something is completely dead you go through its pockets for loose change gentleman I got this from had two boards the same problem uh, this one is also blown up in the same way but nowhere near as bad this one well there's a few parts on it which can be used to fix this one and that's about all that's good on it yet so that's probably for another video thanks for watching